Well, this morning we are starting a brand new series over this book by Tom Rainer, I Am a Church Member. And the reason for that is because he asserts, and I can agree with this, that maybe we have forgotten what it means. We've lost sight of what it means to be called the church, to be members of the church. Now, sometimes we can, we can say things like, where do you go to church or come to my church? Now, though there's nothing wrong with these sorts of statements in and of themselves, we have to be careful to make sure that we don't move uh, from, from something that's saying, well, this is belonging kind of language to language of ownership. You know, this is my church. And so it's, it's the difference of establishing that, that we can either see that the church is something that we are a part of or it's something that we own, as in like we're a boss, we're in control of it. I don't know if you've ever heard people say this like I have, uh, say something like, I don't have to go to church to be close with God, or I don't have to go to church to meet with God. And though that is true, the people that normally say that to me are not people that are so inundated with scripture reading and service to the body, service to their neighbors, uh, growing in sharing their faith and, uh, and going out and being evangelistic in their zeal for Christ. That's not usually the issue with them. Usually it's something more like they just don't want to go. And so... Is that really the issue? Oh, I can meet with God elsewhere. Or, or is it really you're not wanting to carve out that time Sunday morning to meet with other members of the body? And that's really what it's about, gathering together with other believers so that we can grow and fellowship with each other, bear one another's burdens. As I've said before, when we come to church, we learn something very crucial, which is that you're not in this alone. Regardless of what you're going through in your life, regardless of what you're facing, you're not in it alone unless you choose to be. Sometimes we're, uh, we're made aware that, oh, so-and-so is in the hospital or so-and-so is going through this difficulty and we're caught off guard. How long has this been going on? Months, you say? We didn't even know. And so we see that even in a situation like that, there is a brokenness, there is a broken connection where the body is not able to serve alongside its other members and pick up the slack and serve with them and help them. And so this is what we're going to be focusing on over the next seven weeks. We're going to be asking ourselves each week, what does it really mean to be a church member? Is it where I come? Is it people know me there? Is it I tithe? Or is there something more to it than that? Will you pray with me? God in heaven, we pray that as we look into your word today, we would take the truth from it. God, that we would learn and grow in ourselves, and as a body that we would lock arms with one another. As your word says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. God, let us lock arms. Let us sharpen one another. Let us grow in fellowship and in belonging in this body of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what I believe we're going to see this morning as we look predominantly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we're also going to be taking a little walk through 13 and 14 as well. What I think we're going to see is Paul is going to show us that there are three major ways in which you must behave or act in order to be a functioning member of the body of Christ. This is over chapter 1 in that book, I Am a Church Member, that you see right there. And the first one is from 1 Corinthians 12, and we're starting in verse 4. Uh, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version, uh, so if your version is different, you can either follow along on the screen behind me, or you can look in your 
passage uh, in whatever translation you have, know that though there may be different words or they're switched around, it's the same concept, the same thing is being shared. So just so you know. Starting in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, before we jump right into the message, what we've prepared, um, I just want to point out something that's very interesting here. We see uh, kind of ratcheting up in verse 4, varieties of gifts. Verse 5, they're used in a variety of ministries. Verse 6, to a variety of effects. And so someone may use, uh, some people may have the same gift. One person uses it for hospital ministry. Another uses it in the youth ministry. Same gift, different ministries, different effects to those gifts. So that's just an example of the many ways that God uses the various gifts in various individuals to accomplish his purposes. And I also want to point out, it's kind of interesting, verse 4, Spirit, verse 5, Lord, verse 6, God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Spirit dropping that in for us. God in three persons. So he ends in verse 7. Each of these is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So the first way in which we must be a functioning member of the church is using gifts for the good. If we are in Christ, then we are in God. We are his children. And yet, Scripture tells us that at some point in time, we are to grow up, right? Look at what uh, the Spirit tells us through Paul again. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, starting in verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all respects or all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. What we see here is not just the uh, the illustration of the body, which Paul gets into in chapter 12, 13, and 14, of first corinthians but we also see this idea of we start as children but we're meant to grow up in christ who is our head he is our boss warren wearsby puts this in a very interesting way he says the source of the gift is god the sphere for administering the gift is from god And the energy to use the gift is from God. Why then glorify men? Why compete with one another? And this is something that we see Paul addressing in 1 Corinthians 12. That apparently in the church in Corinth, there is some competing going on. And so Wearsby brings out how Paul is addressing the who, what, where, and how of this gift that the Spirit gives to each individual. What gift is given? Where is it to be used? How is it to be used? So these things are given. And uh, he also gives an example that honestly I wish I would have thought of. He says it's kind of like what's going on in the Corinthian church is like, like children with toys. But Paul is saying, no, no, it should be you're like adults with tools to be used. Now, I see this in my own life in in relationship with my son, Jace. He's three years old. He'll be four soon. He often says to Caris, we'll we'll hear him saying, no, Caris, this isn't your toy. This is my toy. This isn't your toy. And he says it over and over again. Well, 
I got to see a different side of this this past week. When we go to the playground that's right behind our house, we, uh, we like to run around. I'll play chase you with him. I'll chase him around. Uh, I'll encourage him as he's climbing up. Good job. Awesome, buddy. And as it often happens, pretty much every time there are other kids there, as I'm encouraging Jace and saying, good job, buddy, good job. Caris is climbing up. I'm like, good job, baby girl. Awesome, awesome. Kids will start to follow me. They start to follow me. And they'll say, look what I can do. You know, and they want to do something. Look what, look what I can do. They want that encouragement. They want someone to notice them. Sometimes I'll have kids run up behind me and like when I'm playing chase you with Jace, they'll come up behind me at first, slowly at first, just kind of watching. And then they'll get behind me and go, Rawr! <laughs> and then run to see if I'm following them. Of course I don't follow them because I'm there with my son. I'm playing with my son. Well, I got to see another side of this kind of like my toy this past week. So this is happening with a boy and he's running around and he's calling me to follow him. And of course I'm ignoring him because I'm there with my son. I know I probably shouldn't do that, but I'm giving preference to my boy, right? And so this boy finally runs off and we're separated by the length of the playground and I'm watching my son because I'm so focused on him and he's just watching this boy. And then after what seems like a long time, I'm like, what is he looking at now? He says, that's not your daddy, that's my daddy. You play by yourself. And I was like, awesome. Wait, no, that's not good. But secretly, I was very happy about that. Sometimes my boy loves me. <laughs> and it's great. And I think what Paul is pointing out here is that we have this kind of issue going on in the Corinthian church. People are saying, this is my gift. This is my gift. Instead of using their gifts as tools for the building up of the body, for the common good. And that leads us to uh, something that is broken within this body that, that Paul brings to light. And it is the second way in which we must use our gifts. We use our gifts for the love, for the love of God and for the love of others, not just those within the body, but also outside the body. See, it seems like Paul is trying to combat some kind of fighting and backbiting that's going on in the Corinthian church. And he's saying this is not how things are supposed to be. We see two examples of this, at least, in chapter 12, and I want to draw these out. The first is in verse 15. Paul writes, If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And so right there we see, huh, I'm, a, I'm a hand, but I'm not a foot, so I don't matter. And so sometimes, because of a lack of love in ourselves, we can look at somebody else's gift, a gift that we look at and we value, and we're like, man, they have the ability to play music, everybody in their family. I don't have this gift. So my gifts don't matter. And there's a lack of love there. We, all, we often don't think of that being a lack of love, but that's the reality. We're not loving ourselves. But then there's another example in verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And so this is the example of someone else standing over here and saying, <laughs> your gift isn't like mine, so you don't matter. And so we see this lack of love within the body that is developing where either one is saying, ah, I envy your gift and so my gifts don't matter, or I invalidate your gift because it's not like mine, so it doesn't matter. And Paul is instructing through the power of the Holy Spirit that this should not be the way things are. And so what are we really saying? What are we really saying 
when we either invalidate our own gift or the gift of another. What are we saying but the Spirit of God messed up? But see, the Spirit of God doesn't mess up. We mess up. We mess up all too often. And when we are lacking this love for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, not only can we not serve the body for the common good, but we're not going to function well, even ourselves as a member of the body of Christ. We're not going to love well. So we don't have the same gifts. This is what Paul brings up in chapter 12. He, he lists several gifts. Now, I don't think these are the only gifts, but they're gifts that he mentions. And there are other lists in Scripture of gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. Because there are many. We don't have the same gifts. Sometimes that can be hard when we value one gift over another. But we don't have all the same gift. We do, however, have the same love. It is the love of God, the God who himself is love, gives us this love, to love out of what he gives us, to love others with that same love. And so if we take passages in Scripture in their fullness, if we look at chapter 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians, what we're seeing is, first off, in chapter 13, that's the love chapter, right? If you've been in church for a long time, you, oh, you've probably heard and reheard uh, to nausea, the love chapter. Well, sometimes we can use this as, oh, well, it's the ultimate marital love. It, this is agape. This is unconditional love. And I think we had it in our wedding. And there's nothing wrong. No, we didn't. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. That's sad. <laughs> At any rate, I still love you. We hear this all the time in weddings, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Oh, uh, oh. Uh. It does not boast. Oh, uh, oh. Uh. That's what Paul has already addressed in chapter 12, hasn't he? So yes, it is a description of the ideal marital love, of agape, unconditional love. But it is also, taking it in context, the kind of love that we should experience and give and receive within the body of Christ. Contextually, that's what it says. He, he doesn't lose his train of thought and, you know, in a sense, squirrel, Okay, let's talk about love. Squirrel, back to gifts, right? Led by the Spirit, he is giving us a picture of love within the body of Christ, and it is beautiful. And then in chapter 14, he starts talking a little bit more specifically about tongues and prophecy. He uses these two gifts in particular as examples, in 14.4, he talks about how these gifts are used for the edification, for the building up of the body of Christ. And that's what all gifts really are used for, for instruction, for guidance, for growth within the body. This may be a rabbit trail, but I don't think it is. As Paul is, is trying to talk to us about gifts and what the reasoning for these gifts are, he says repeatedly, they're given by the same God. The same Spirit gives these gifts for the common good. So how are we using them? And so he talks about prophecy. Now, sometimes we can look at this word prophecy and we can get misled. I know I was for many, many years until just recently in the whole scope of my life. I thought of prophecy as telling of the future. But did you know that the lion's share, over 90% of passages in Scripture that have to do with prophecy, when a prophet is sharing a message, very little does it have to do with foretelling the future. What it does address 
when we're looking at prophecy is it shows us who God is, what he expects, and what that means for us. So sometimes prophecy does talk about the future, but more often than not, and even when it does talk about the future, what it is telling us is something about God, who God is, what he expects, and what that means for us. Then how now shall we live when we come to prophecy? And so that leads us to this third way this third way that we must be a functioning member in the body of Christ. And that is using gifts for the lost. In chapter 14, Paul addresses a couple of instances. And we can gather from the context that there are certain things happening in the church in Corinth. Namely, with these uses of prophecy and speaking in tongues. Paul is trying to address, I've heard of these problems. He might have even seen them. There, there's the problem that when people are coming in, they may not know what they're seeing. And so he's kind of asking us, reading the book of 1 Corinthians after the fact, we're kind of supposed to ask ourselves, who's, who's benefiting from my gift? When I use this gift that God has given me, who's benefiting? Or am I kind of using it for a weapon? Paul seems to say that there are some people that are using it, and it's coming across like a weapon. It's not, it's not fulfilling what the Spirit desires. See, in, uh, in chapter 12, starting in verse 11, we're going to see that the Spirit gives as the Spirit wills. Starting in verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. But for the body is not one member, but many. So we're one body, but many different members. The Spirit gives as the Spirit wills for the Spirit's purposes so that God would be glorified, so that the body would be unified, right? But Paul is addressing how something has gone amiss in the Corinthian body. Something has gone amiss. And though the, though the Spirit gives as the Spirit wills, the Corinthians are using their gifts as they will. And the result, he says, is chaos. He says, what would happen if a non-believer comes into your body and they hear all these people uh, speaking in tongues, they're going to think you're mad. They're not going to think, wow, the Spirit of God is moving in this place. They're going to think you're mad. And so he lays out, this is how this gift should be used. And I think this is crucial. There is something beautiful about these instructions, you can read those in chapter 14 later, but in a nutshell, it's like, hey, if you're speaking in tongues, one at a time, and there's got to be someone interpreting. And if there's not, well, then you shouldn't be speaking in tongues, right? Because the purpose of the gift is for the building up of the entire body. And so if someone's being left out and someone's not receiving that building up, then the gift is not being used well. And this is huge because though Christ gives us the gift by the Holy Spirit individually, purposefully, it's not like possession. And he takes over and all of a sudden we're flesh marionettes that he moves around. We are still in control. And God gives us these gifts and the place to use them and the effect that they will have on the body and those outside the body. And we are in control of using them. If we are out of control, 
then according to Paul, according to Scripture, according to the Spirit of God, as we read in the Word, it might not be of God. And so we are called to ask, when we use our gifts, is it Spirit-led? Is it a Spirit-led working in our gifting? Or is it just out of control? God purposefully gifts through the power of his spirit. He says in 1433 that God is a God of peace, not a God of confusion. And so there is purpose and there is proper use of a gift. And all of this is for the equipping, the building up of the body in Christ for the mission of of God, which is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus as we go out. And so this is the purpose of our gifting. And so here we see three ways in which we must be functioning members of the body of Christ. We are to be using our gifts for the good, for the love, and for the lost, biblically. So what is our challenge today? In a nutshell, I think it's to to be functioning in love, to be founded on and grounded on love. Are we working in love? Are we sharing our gifts and abilities in love? See, when we use our gifts, we should never lose sight of the Christ by whose name we're called. We are to be Christ-centered. We are to be unified around our core, who is Jesus. And we are to be spirit-led, not out of control. And so, one of the things that that Tom Rayner addresses in his book, in chapter 1, is that there's, there's really no such thing as an inactive church member. That's not even possible. So what would it look like if our body just stopped working? This body of Christ, what if it stopped working? Some people could make the argument, well, I'm not getting paid for this. You guys who are on staff, y'all are getting paid for this. Well, I don't do it for the money, and neither does Jason, neither does Doug, neither does anybody else that's on staff here. And imagine what would happen to this body of believers if we were the only ones that were serving. And what would that say about us? Are we only serving because we're getting paid? That's not the case. We're not doing this for the money. We're not doing this to get paid. We're doing it because God has called us to do it. And so we're using these gifts. And as God has equipped all of you, you are to share those gifts Use those gifts, not just for your own benefit, but for the benefit and the growth of the body as a whole. What would it be like if our bodies stopped working? If some member of our body just kaputs, stopped working? Well, I think that's an interesting thing to think about and even a better thing to kind of test out. So, your challenge today not giving you a three-week thing. And this doesn't mean that you get to stop the previous challenge I gave you, which is reading two chapters of Scripture every day. Okay, You keep, keep going with that. Watch God grow you as you do that. Read just two chapters of Scripture a day. If you want to do more, do more. But get that two in. So in addition to that, today, what I want us all to do, from 12 noon... To 3 p.m. <clears throat> 12 noon, 3 p.m. This is your challenge. Do not use your thumbs. Now, listen, there, there's a reason for this. Some of you may not be able to trust yourselves. Get some tape, <clears throat> tape it around, tape it down. Don't use your thumbs. I have a reason for this. These are useful. 
they're very helpful. When you, if you've ever been in that place where you haven't been able to use your thumb, opposable thumbs are very useful. So I'm challenging you guys for three hours, just three hours, don't use your thumbs. And as you start to understand, man, this is really difficult. It's really hampering my ability to do what I'm supposed to do. Let that draw you to the throne room of God to pray, not just for yourself, that you would be using your gifts in service to the body, but also in service to the community, but also that you would be praying for everybody here, everybody in our church, everybody in the churches surrounding the Pleasant Hill, Des Moines area. Be praying for those people. God, give us a heart to use the gifts that you have given us. I know, I know, right? <clears throat> I don't know that <clears throat> I want to do this. So not only will it draw you to the throne room in prayer, but also there's an evangelistic side to it. I mean, I know some of you could be like, well, I was going to go out to eat, but now I'm just going to go take a nap from about 12 to 3. <laughs> Don't do that. There's an evangelistic element to this. So if you're going around and you're not using your thumbs and you don't have this big thing on it so that people can tell, oh, I bet their thumb is broken, people are going to want to know, why are you trying to eat like that? Are you making fun of handicapped people? This gives you an opportunity to share transparently, honestly. No, you know, we were challenged by our pastor who is also kind of a sicko. I can't believe he gave us this to do. <laughs> but he's challenging us to think about the fact that sometimes as a church, we don't do what we should. We don't reach out to those outside of our walls. Sometimes we don't use our gifts as we should. And so he's challenging us to think about how we can better use our gifts and to pray for those in our midst to use their gifts. And then, who knows, you have the opportunity to share with someone about what Christ has done in you. And now you're being challenged. Man, if I'm in Christ, let my life be different. Let me be a servant. Let me be a giver of this gift he has given me. And uh, then we also talked about, well, there should be a penalty if you feel like going home and taking a nap for three hours so you don't have to do it, or just saying, I ain't going to do it. So here's the penalty. If you use your thumbs from 12 to 3, then you have to bring one bag of chocolate to the office next week. And of course, she said, well, I like coffee. What about coffee? Me and Jason like coffee. Okay, so one bag of chocolate or coffee to the church next week if you do not fulfill your challenge. Are you strong enough to accept it? <laughs> yeah, people have to work. People have to work. Man, it's going to be tough without your thumbs. So... <laughs> So I encourage you guys to take up this challenge. Use it as an opportunity to pray for yourself, for others, for this church body, and use it as an opportunity to share the grace that we have been given in Christ. And now, if you will, go ahead and stand with me. The worship team is going to come forward for a song of invitation. Whoa, we got a lot of popcorn conversation. You guys are talking about, like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> so this is a time for you to react. And not react, but be proactive. What have you heard from the Spirit of God? Maybe God has laid something on your heart this morning about your own relationship to Jesus. Maybe you've heard a lot of things about Jesus. Maybe you caught what Steve was talking about up here, and you were like, what do you mean Jesus died for my sins and then rose from the grave? Well, maybe you don't know much about that. In a nutshell, 
Jesus was God in the flesh, the word of God made flesh who came to both uphold the righteousness and the perfection of God's perfect law, but also to die in our place, to take our sins upon himself and die the death that we deserved because of our sins. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you're less than perfect, you have sinned and you have offended a holy God. And yet this God loves you so much that he died in your place in the person of Jesus so that you would not have to die. And that by believing on his name, trusting in him, and turning from your sins, you can be promised abundant life now and eternal life with God one day. If you need to respond to that message, this is your time. Maybe you just need some prayer. Come forward. Let me pray with you. Pray on your own. If you feel like you want to kneel here at this proverbial altar, you can, you can bow your head where you sit. You can, you can sit if you want to. You can pray alone. But if you want someone to pray with you, I would love to pray with you. Respond to God. Respond to the Holy Spirit. It's not of me. This gift, sometimes it doesn't even work well. Sometimes I get in the way. So if you have heard something this morning that has pricked your conscience or stirred your heart, trust that it is the Spirit of God. It is not me. And respond during this song of invitation.